Hi, everyone. I think we're live. It's always weird with these Zoom um, meetings. It would be much nicer to meet in person when you know if, um, if things are starting. But I think um, this is it. So it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Julia Belouz. I'm a health reporter. And I'm going to be moderating today's uh, media panel. So we're going to be looking at um, reflecting on the last couple of years of COVID coverage, what went right, what went wrong, um, what can we learn. Um, and so I'm coming at this, um, having covered global public health for many, many years, um, many, many outbreaks, Ebola, measles, um, HIV, yellow fever, you name it. And long before COVID, um, I was writing about how, you know, we were, we were in this unique moment where um, we were at a greater risk of um, novel pathogens um, going epidemic or pandemic. Um, how the WHO was uniquely poised to respond, but how um, it was also in sore need of reform. Um, about America's lack of preparedness for the next pandemic um, and under Trump um, just before COVID, but also um, the fraying of the public health infrastructure for many, many years before Trump. And then COVID came along, right? And so many of us, and including many of you in the audience and um, our panelists today, um, knew, knew that um, we were well situated for a pandemic. And yet, um, you know, the question we're going to be looking at today was how did the media respond? How did we, um, yeah, respond to the call of duty when, when the pandemic came? And to sort of um, situate the conversation, I wanted to share, there was this media, um, recent analysis of print and online newspaper coverage of the, of the virus in the first six months um, from March to August 2020 in three countries, Canada, the UK, and the US. Um, before I share the results, this is a nice, I think, chart sort of reminding us of the different phases of the pandemic that we've been through. So the discussions about, um, so, the, so here you can see, yeah, the pu public health policies and measures mentioned in news media and how it sort of fluctuates over time um, where social and physical distancing is something that's more emphasized, reopening policies um, become more and more discussed, um, testing for infection, vaccine, masks, um, supply chain disruptions, disinfection, all, all the travel restrictions, remember that. Um, yeah, all these different debates that um, were happening throughout the pandemic and they conclude there was this, I guess, a more political finding. So newspapers oriented toward the populist right had the lowest quality reporting combined with very low sensationalism in some cases. And despite the generally assumed benefits of low sensationalism, pandemic related coverage was low scientific quality that also failed to alert readers to public health risks, misinformation or policy failures may have exacerbated the public health effects of the disease and news media um, reporting grappled with complications of scientific understanding and uncertainties during this time frame of the study. And um, yeah, and so an overall scientific quality, so the mechanisms of disease transmission, especially airborne transmission, which Tom is gonna talk a bit about, um, the scientific quality of reporting overall did not improve as the pandemic went along, et cetera, et cetera. So it's kind of, um, yeah, not the most, positive finding, and I think it's not um, so surprising. So the science was moving incredibly quickly. Emotions were running high. People were scared. Um, the debate from the outset was extremely political in many countries. And I'd also argue that, um, yeah, well, perhaps at the same time, yeah, the average story, the quality might've been quite low. There were there were many examples of journalistic excellence too, but, um, but maybe it was drowned out by a lot of the noise. But our panelists um, who are joining us today have many more interesting thoughts than this. And oops, how do I advance the slide? Okay, so today's speakers. So we have Tom Jefferson up first. Um, he's a senior associate tutor at Oxford, a former researcher at the Nordic Cochrane Center and former scientific director for the production of HTA products on non-pharmaceuticals for the Italian National Agency of Regional Healthcare. And he's been working on epidemi the epidemiology of respiratory viruses since the early 90s. I've had the pleasure of interviewing him many times about um, many of his interesting um, studies. 
Mia Milan is the founding editor-in-chief of the Becky Sisa Center for Health Journalism in South Africa, and that's a donor-funded media startup focusing on solutions-based reporting on issues related to health policy and analysis. And she's worked in newsrooms and media development organizations in Johannesburg, Nairobi, and Washington. So um, we're going to jump right into their presentations, um, Tom followed by Mia, and then uh, move into discussion and Q&A. And you can drop um, your questions and answers in the Q&A chat um, next. It should just be at the bottom of your screen next to screen share. So with, um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Tom. OK. Um, can you see my slides? Um, can you see my slides? The share. Yeah. And now when you Let me know if there's any problems. I don't see slides from you yet, but maybe try again because I just stopped the screen share for me. Could you click on the share, please? Can you see them? No. Uh, I can't. I can't hear. I'm sorry, Sultan. You were very, very garbled. Um, what do I need to do? Share screen. Yes, click on share screen. Okay. I apologize for my cack handiness. Okay. You should be able to share my screen and see my um, slides now. No, yeah. Uh, click on my share. Yes. Can you see it? Yes. 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 Thank you. Sorry, uh, Sultan, you're a bit garbled, I think, because of a problem with the Wi Fi. Oh, good, yes. good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much for um, inviting me, uh, Lubna and, and Julia, uh, to talk to you about uh, the research um, and the evidence um, that we analyzed on SARS-CoV-2 uh, and specifically on transmission of SARS-CoV-2. So I'm not going to talk about other aspects of SARS-CoV-2. But transmission itself in this presentation is a uh, means to uh, discuss uh, exactly what happened to us in the last two and a half years. So not only the research, but also its dissemination and our personal experience. I talked to them for myself, but I'm part of a large group of people who do systematic reviews. If you want to know more about myself, You've got my website uh, on the slide, which I hope you can see. And also uh, I will get to trust the evidence towards the end when we talk about alternative ways of communicating. Okay, so this is the outline. First of all, I'll give you a little bit of background to myself and what I do, what I've done, and talk about respiratory viruses. Um, and then I'll talk about what I call the transmission flip-flop, which I think will become clear when I get to it. Um, we'll talk about the COVID pandemic and this collective amnesia which um, swept throughout the research community and decision-making community, um, thereby forgetting about 100 years worth of uh, previous research. I'll give you some example, uh, one example, one sanitized example of a personal attack which we have gone uh, un undergone. And I'd like to put that in the context of our research and how difficult it is, it was, to keep going in the middle of all this and try and produce some stuff which we thought was minimally biased, was not partisan, and was based on the best available evidence. And that in itself was a, was a struggle to uh, define the best available evidence. I will end up with reflections, um, and uh, reflections are exactly that. They're my views and no one else's. So if I may proceed, Julia, I'll, uh, I'll, I will start with my background. So as Julia said, I've been working uh, on the epidemiology of respiratory viruses on and off for about 30 years. These are some of the examples of my outputs. They are Cochrane reviews, and I've done other non-Cochrane systematic reviews on a variety of, of subjects, but specific to today, 
these are perhaps the, the most relevant. Um, the first one uh, has been going since 1997 when we first published the protocol. The second one has been going since 2006 before anybody was interested in hand washing masks or anything like uh, um, barriers or anything. Uh, there was very little interest. Uh, and the third one is neuromelase inhibitors, so antivirals, category of antivirals. And that's been going on since 1999. And they've been updated nth times. For instance, physical interventions, the middle one is undergoing its fifth update uh, since 2006. Now, respiratory viruses have been uh, extensively studied, not extensively understood, but extensively studied, really since uh, in a relatively modern time, since the times of uh, Spanish influenza. Um, initially, the research was all done by, as you can imagine, uh, military, um, uh, military researchers, uh, simply because this was a, uh, an illness which swept throughout the uh, the warring factions uh, causing, we're not quite sure what it caused, but it certainly caused a lot of damage. So the initial, uh, the initial interest in respiratory viruses came from uh, two uh, sources. The first one was keeping people in the front line uh, to get shot and killed rather than bed. And the second one was equally to keep munitions workers and uh, workers which were essent essential to the military effort in the First World War to keep them at work and not in bed. From there, we moved on and has been a continuous discovery and an evolving understanding. Um, initially, uh, the, the, first, uh, it, the first agent to be actually positively identified was uh, swine influenza by a guy called Richard Shope. I don't know whether anybody's ever heard of him, but he's a, he should have got a Nobel uh, Prize for what he did. A year later, Smith laid low on uh, Andrews, uh, ident identify the agent of human influenza. And that's 1933. And then he's just moved on from there. And we are continuing discovering new agents as the story of SARS-CoV-2 uh, and, and SARS and MERS shows. This is a highly complex field dominated by a uh, disproportionate attention to uh, just a few agents. If you cast your mind back, uh, there was nothing else on the plate other than influenza. The influenza virus was be all and end all. Now there's influenza and SARS uh, and probably RSV. Uh, just just breaking breaking through people's conscience but there's hundreds of agents that we know of and an unknown number of agents that we have never identified and are probably already circulating the problem with all of this is that these agents are associated with a syndrome so that's a constellation of signs and symptoms um like we're all familiar with, like fever, cough, uh, aches and pains, and so on, which are not agent specific. So you can't see a patient in your surgery and say, ah, I recognize uh, he's, he or she has got uh, clearly got an influ a, a, a rhinovirus 16 infection and uh, see a child and say that this is RSV. You can't do that. Clinically, you cannot distinguish them. So you have to have a so-called laboratory test, you have to have a confirmation. And this is very important because the majority of uh, people who have worked recently in this field and have got no clinical experience don't understand that. Uh, it, these are essentially primary care uh, problems, these respiratory viruses, and the, the cyclical nature, the, the, uh, they are primary care, a uh, primary care syndrome not a disease and they they go from there's a spectrum they go from a mild illness all the way down to death unfortunately so a few sniffles or even asymp no symptoms whatsoever all the way down to very serious complications 
Now, one of the problems, uh, and I will explain how we found that out, is that the causation and attribution rules. So um, when you're looking at transmission, what role does agent X play? So the attribution rules are being lagging behind. The attribution, the, the last accepted or proposed attribution rules dated back to 1978. And this is just simply just not good enough in the age of fantastic weapons that we've got in our hands, like molecular diagnostics and gene sequencing. So here immediately we've got a problem. We have a, uh, we, we have uh, a, a split between clinical medicine, uh, between, let's call it laboratory medicine, microbiology, and then epidemiology. And the three have to be put together to get a co coherent picture of what is going on. So we decided that we were going to go into uh, look at transmission. Um, vaccines were not around at the time, if you remember. And antivirals were, uh, we'd already been in antivirals with influenza. So we decided to look at transmission and that was, that was really quite, it's been a, quite an interesting ride. But in, in transmission, we had uh, we were in the middle of what was what I call the transmission flip flop. What does it mean? Well, you see on the left, uh, you've got a tweet which dates from the early days of the pandemic in which WHO made a sweeping statement that the, the, the SARS-CoV-2 is not transmitted, not transmitted uh, by airborne means. Um, the only comment I would make about that is that anybody making sweeping statements about respiratory viruses um, is on a very dangerous tack because we don't uh, we don't really understand uh, the uh, completely understand the ecology of them. And in fact, as you can see on the right, you've got an article dated from uh, last year, February last year. Uh, it's a polemic on the on the Lancet. I'm not going to go into that, but the, it it there are already there's, there's there's let's call them two ways of looking at it, and it got a lot more serious than that and very acrimonious. Now, when you're trying to concentrate and trying to pick up the pieces of the evidence, we're in, we're interested in evidence. We we don't have a um, preference for this or that uh, mode of transmission. But this had become, as was becoming heavily politicized, and we fell in the middle of it. So this transmission riddle um, fell on our desk because we uh, were asked by WHO to carry out a first set of reviews on the main means of transmission, airborne, aerofecal, fecal, close contact, fomites, um, vertical, that's mother to baby. And in this, this first uh, swathe of reviews, which were very sort of general and almost like scoping reviews, we found there was huge gaps in the quality of evidence and tools uh, that were used by these studies, hundreds of studies, uh, different studies in different situations. Now, one of the, for instance, one of the howlers, the obvious howlers, was the uh, the fact that some studies uh, thought that PCR positivity equaled infectiousness. So the qualitative PCR, polymerase chain reaction, positive, negative, was, a, was equivalent to infectiousness, which is not correct. Uh, it is not, it's just a, a tiny piece of a very large, uh, bigger picture. And we found, for instance, that some studies didn't even report the type of test that they were running. So they were saying, this guy was positive, this one was negative. But what tests did they use? Didn't report it. Um, so it, it, it is very difficult to understand exactly what they were, uh, what had taken place and draw conclusion from such a, a, a poor evidence base. It, it, so what we did is we thought, well, let's create a some kind of standard. Uh, let's let's create something which brought together these three perspectives: the clinical perspective, the microbiological, molecular biological perspective, new, modern, wonderful tests that we have at our disposal at the moment, uh, gene sequencing, and the epi traditional epidemiology. 
And you can see all our output. We have got now quite a number of reviews which are all published or in the process of being published. The last one was accepted about four days ago for uh, publication in the biomedical journal. And you've got the link at the bottom of the slide. You can st still see my slides, Julia, can you? Yeah, okay. Um, now, this is a strange phenomenon. This COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, uh, collective amnesia, all of a sudden, uh, 100 years of discovery and, uh, for instance, uh, of transmission, um, uh, work on transmission of other agents, still respiratory viruses, m most of them RNA viruses, in fact, were completely forgotten overnight. It's as if they did, hadn't existed. And then people were making sweeping statements. Uh, you've seen one sweeping statement by WHO, but there was lots of sweeping statements. I know that this will happen, and this will happen in six months. And the mainstream media picked them up, and people overnight who had no history of working in this field were making uh, disastrously wrong predi predictions. They were confusing. They were scaring people. They were um, really not also not uh, understanding the limits of our knowledge and the limits of the tools at our disposal at present. When my group decided to concentrate uh, on a transmission and then it got widely known that we were receiving WHO funding, uh, that turned ugly, really ugly, uh, with uh, uh, personal attacks, uh, censorship, uh, and things like canvassing for complaints was because canvassing for complaints is um, writing uh, around either on social media or somewhere in your discussion list saying, why don't you write a letter to the GMC complaining about this guy? Um, and you will see in the next slide exactly how nice this uh, can be. So here's an example of a personal attack, uh, to, personal on me or my group, it doesn't matter, it's all members. So uh, as I said, we, try, we were trying to, to um, or we tried to uh, put some order in all of this chaos. And we came up with a, um, a tool which put together these three perspectives, the clinical, the microbiological, and the epi. And you can see the tool, it's that pyramid on the right. What you've got here is you've got on the right, you've got a tweet. And I can't read that tweet very well at the moment because I've got panels of uh, three panels of um, Zoom uh, on, on the right of the screen. But essentially what they're doing is they are saying that because we were saying that the highest level would be an experimental inoculation of a human challenge study, so human studies, studies, studies are probably the top uh, as far as, or one of the uh, one, one of the top proofs of transmission by a per certain mean. Um, and challenge studies have been being done ever since we know of since Edward Jenner's experiments. Well, we we got dubbed Mengele, and this is Mengele's pyramid of airborne transmission for airborne transmission. Um, and to be clear, we, we just haven't caged and infected humans yet, this, the, these, uh, this tweet has said. They were accusing us of um, wanting to experiment on human beings for reasons like Dr. Mengele, which, as you know, was ideological. Well, this referred to the to a, a preprint, which you can see on the left, which we posted on 23rd of April, 2021. And the preprint was a first version of this hierarchical framework for assessing the causality of transmission um, for, uh, amongst the respiratory viruses. The people who posted that tweet, however, had not read the paper or they had ignored the bits that they wanted to ignore because the paper said, however, Experimentation, says in, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, is unlikely to be ethical unless an intervention to interrupt the chain of transmission is tested and challenge studies are ethically difficult to justify. That's the text of the preprint, and we gave them two references. 
And yet, that tweet made the rounds everywhere. In fact, after six months, about six months after, um, uh, Killingly uh, at, uh, and uh, colleagues from, I think, UCH, publish the first challenge study of SARS-CoV-2. It was a very important study, which follows in, in the tradition of about 100 years of challenge studies, which are an important tool that we need to, uh, um, we, we need to continue using when ethically feasible. Um, some colleagues of ours from um, Israel and Australia, by the way, have um, uh, published a taxonomy of censorship. Well, I call it taxonomy. They don't call it that, but it's coming out in, a, uh, in Minerva uh, very soon. If anybody wants a copy, um, I will send you a private copy and uh, um, ask me, and I will send you a private copy, but it's about to come out. It's been accepted for publication. So this is a, a re relatively minor episode of personal attack. So what did we do? Well, we, despite all this stuff, we decided to stay the course on evidence, just, just concentrate on evidence. And here you can see where we went. We went to the, uh, the photograph on the right is an aerial photograph of the uh, MRC common coal unit, which had been closed in 1989 by the British government. And the reason for closing it is because the respiratory viruses were no longer an issue, quote, unquote. Um, the common coal unit, uh, and actually amongst its many laurels, was the place where the first coronavirus was identified where 229E and OC43 were identified and cultured, and even the first rhinovirus, although it wasn't called that, it was eventually called a rhinovirus 16. There was about 150 or more serotypes of different rhinoviruses, and they are the most uh, common uh, viral agent associated with common cold. And we, we, we used these, the, the work of, we based our work on those of these, of these no longer with us masters. The common cold unit in Salisbury in the United Kingdom, the University of Wisconsin and Madison in the United States, uh, the University of uh, West Virginia, Charlottesville. Uh, these were masters, they were pioneers. They, they studied coronas and rhinos and RSV, parainfluenza, influenza, they studied all these viruses and they gave us a lot of insight into what's going on. Uh, at the moment, but they were just forgotten overnight in this sort of strange amnesia. On the left, you've got the page uh, of uh, the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine, Oxford University page, which has got all our work, uh, all our published work, published work. And here it is. Um, it's uh, this is one way of looking at things, not necessarily the right way. But we published it in uh, Viruses, which is a specialist journal. And as you can see, it's, it's a pyramid, a hierarchical pyramid, which aims to narrow uncertainty. Narrow uncertainty. It doesn't give you certainty. There's nothing certain to do, to do with respiratory viruses. So it narrows uncertainty as a more and better quality uh, of evidence becomes available going from the bottom to the to the top so the top is as we said something like for instance from a microbiological point of view the presence of uh, uh, the certain presence of replicating competent SARS-CoV-2 this can be seen by viral cultures or by decreasing cycle threshold associated with the polymerase chain reaction and this is, for me, is the real breakthrough in this current pandemic, scientific breakthrough that we've made. To understanding that we no longer may need serial viral cultures, we we'll only need serial PCRs with cycle thresholds and uh, put those results in uh, the context of a clinical, uh, a clinical picture with a drug history and an epidemiology that's, that follows the uh, normal, the, the, the follows the uh, principles of Gwaltney 1978. 
And you can see uh, the application here on the left of this instrument. We published it in uh, our review of asymptomatics, asking whether asymptomatics and presymptomatics can produce replication competent virus. And you can see from the PRISMA um, algorithm, there bottom on the left, that out of 444 papers, uh, we were basically noise, we managed to actually restrict the field to 18 and to get some answers. So it actually helps to diminish that colossal amount of noise that we had. This is the one of the strategies that we used to um, communicate on the left. You see one of, one, one of the versions of our review on viral cultures, relationship between PCR and viral culture to assess effect, uh, infectiousness, uh, replication competent. First of all, we published it on a preprint. Then we went to a specialist journal and published it on a specialist journal and it's had over 250 citations so far. Um, so we come to our, my reflections. Um, it, it's very, very difficult to uh, keep going on, on a track like this in the face of personal threats, censorship, personal attacks and so on. But we decided not to engage in um, extremism, rebuttals, not to engage in polemics, not to respond to personal attacks. We had very little public support from anyone outside a group, but very, quite a lot of uh, private support. But the private support is a two-edged sword. It's almost like you're saying, well, I'm very glad you're doing this work, rather you than me, because I don't want to get my head shot off. So it's good to have uh, private support, but a little bit more public support would have been a good thing. Um, and we have to find new ways of communication um, because the biomedical journals, the main biomedical journals, the mainline biomedical journals are not the place that are likely to uh, publish anything which is uh, like the material I've just shown you. Um, they're not interested. They're interested in black and white views and polemics in uh, in research, which is sponsored by uh, large interests or can sell reprints. And they they do not. We know that for certain. They just refuse. They've always refused. Historically, refused to take uh, responsibility for the, the the nonsense that they publish sometimes. Um, there's privately, I can give you a, quite a lot of examples, but I, I'm not publicly because I don't want to get uh, sued. What role has mainstream media had? Well, mainstream media uh, is made up of people like us, uh, and they've had a catastrophic role as far as I'm concerned. Um, but then uh, quite a, a large proportion of um, of people who made a noise had a catastrophic role in this whole uh, story. So uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Over to you, Julia. Tom, thank you so much for, for your talk. And I'm very sorry to learn about the, the personal attacks and, and whatnot that you faced. Um, I think if, if Mia is ready, we will turn the floor over to her. There she is. Okay, and then and then we'll get to the Q and A and discussion. Mia, over to you. Thanks very much, Julia. I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Um, Tom, I think you need to stop sharing your screen, and then I can share my screen. Go. That's it. Can you see it on your side, Julia? I just see you right now. Are you dope? Let me just try that again. There we go. You can see it now, right? Yeah. Okay. 
So thank you very much for the opportunity to, to talk today about our COVID coverage in South Africa and to also look a little bit about how our HIV coverage in South Africa differed with the COVID coverage. But just before we start with that, I wanted to, to just tell you what Pekasisa is shortly because I know it's hard to listen to someone and you don't know from what perspective they're talking. So Pekasisa is a small donor-funded organization, a media organization in South Africa. We started 10 years ago as the health desk of an investigative journalism, an investigative newspaper here in South Africa. And then six months before COVID, we became an independent media organization. And we have about 12 staff members. So if I talk about our reporting, we're a small media startup that feeds our copy to mainstream publications in South Africa. Now, the one big thing between the Western world and more developed world and South Africa when it came to COVID was that we had faced other pandemics. COVID was not our first pandemic. And the most recent one was HIV in my country. We have had hundreds of thousands of deaths in South Africa because of HIV. And we also had a very, very different type of coverage during it. And the reason why everything differed so much is because the political context, which normally informs how journalists report on, a, on an issue, was very different during HIV. Because some of you may recall that during the late, late 1980s, early 2000s, we had a president in South Africa, Thabo Mbeki, and he did not believe that HIV was the cause of AIDS, and he actually still holds that view today. So that meant that when HIV became a very, very big problem in South Africa, we had a president and also a health minister who supported him, who doubted the cause of AIDS. And as a result of that, we didn't have treatment available in the country because the president and the health minister argued that ARVs, which is the main form of treatment for HIV, was absolutely poisonous and would kill more people than save them. And as a result, there was a very, very strong activist movement in South Africa that emerged as a result of that. And there were also many court cases all initiated by these activists. So the biggest court cases centered around access to treatment. And in 2004, when ARVs became available for free in our public sector in South Africa, the reason it became available is because activists had their own lawyers, took the government to court, and the court ordered the government to make the treatment available. It wasn't a spontaneous decision. And during that time, you would see in South Africa that scientists became activists. They would join activists in the country with protesting. They would go and lie over the street, pretending they're dead in white coats as an example of why we need ARVs. They really became something of a bridge between the government and the media, where they explain things very well. But when COVID happened, there was a very different situation in South Africa, because the government didn't doubt the science, or at least the cause of COVID, which is SARS-CoV-2. And that made for a very different type of coverage, at least initially, because there wasn't an enemy that everyone had to fight all the time that, that didn't acknowledge science. It was more of a partnership when the pandemic started. So as a result of them not differing so much with the media at the beginning of the pandemic, the government really embraced evidence and that started to form relatively strong relationships with the media. But you know, when there's something that everyone has to fight against, um, a very strong activist movement emerges because there's an issue everyone is fighting against. But when there isn't a clear issue, in other words, when the government isn't the enemy, the activism isn't as strong. And you don't have that many prominent court cases. So the media cover different things, and I will get to that. And the interesting thing in South Africa is where scientists became activists during HIV. 
During COVID, they became celebrities. They were on TV, left, right, and center, on radio. They had their own Twitter threads that they published. On Twitter, they became very well known with many, many followers. So it was interesting to see how the role changed. And most of the COVID scientists in my country were former HIV scientists. So it was interesting to see how their role of activists changed to becoming more of a, a celebrity kind of person. And the most concrete example of that in South Africa would be the guy that you see on this slide. His name is Salim Abdul Karim, and he is a world-renowned HIV scientist. He is, is, is very, very well acknowledged. And during HIV, he did obviously very groundbreaking research, but our health minister just him. Um, some of you may recall that there was a very big, the International AIDS Conference was held in South Africa in the year 2000, and that was when our President Meki was at, at the head of things, and there was a lot of opposition against him at the conference because of him not acknowledging science. And Salim Abdul Karim was one of the people having enough courage as a scientist to speak out against Becky. And when the health minister at the conference saw him, I saw the scene, she literally called him a traitor and told him to shut up, just like this, like um, in, a, in a very raised voice. But during COVID, the same guy who was called a traitor became the chairperson of the advisory committee who advises the president and the government on what decisions to take. So he's a very clear example of the different entries into the, pand into the two different pandemics in my country because of political context that, different, that was different and a president who embraced science. So if you look at our current president's name is Cyril Ramaphosa, he's the guy on the right hand side in the slide and the um, left hand side is Tab Mbeki. Um, the interesting thing about them is that they had, you know, Mbeki had radical views and Ramaphosa had more um, moderate views, but it was science views and, and you know, what, what sort of evidence they embrace. It wasn't the same as, for instance, in the United States, where it would be Donald Trump, who's a very conservative politician, compared to, say, Joe Biden from a different party. These two people were both from the same political party in my country, so they didn't have radically different political views, for instance. But there's been research that's been done by Harvard University, and they found that had Becky given um, changed policies so that my country had access to free antiretrovirals prior to 2004, 300,000 lives would have been saved in, in, in my country. But the other difference between them was the political context against which the pandemics played off. Now, Mbeki became president very shortly after South Africa became a democracy. We became a democracy in 1994, and in 1999, five years later, Mbeki became president. And I'm mentioning this to explain in the next slide how this changed or how this influenced how they reacted to pandemics. So remember, during apartheid in South Africa, um, when um, white people were oppressors of black people, the white people were seen as Western. So that um, feeling of hostility towards the Western world um, stemmed from a situation that um, had been the case for a while in my country. But Roma became president much later, only in 2018. So 24 years after democracy, when that feeling wasn't as strong any longer. That is not to say that there were no oppositions to COVID vaccines in South Africa. We have a very strong opposition party called the Economic Freedom Fighters. And that feeling of the Western world um, often having prejudice towards Africa and um, the, the fact that, 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 that many people in Africa feel the Western world, world rules and want to force decisions onto Africa, that resulted in the economic, economic freedom fighters, in short, they're the EFF, arguing that we should use only Chinese and Russian vaccines in South Africa because they didn't they, they, they don't perceive those countries as Western countries. Now, South Africa used Pfizer and J&J, which is vaccines which are produced in the Western world. And when our medicines regulator had to approve 
approve vaccines. There were large protests in my country from the AFF demanding um, that our regulator approved Chinese and Russian vaccines as opposed to the Western vaccines. And the Western country vaccines were, of course, approved earlier because they were the, the information to review by our regulator was available earlier. Um, but that was not quite understood by some political parties. There was also politics around AstraZeneca, the vaccine in our country. We couldn't get hold of vaccines because they were bought up by, by um, richer countries. And at some stage, we got hold of AstraZeneca vaccines, 1.5 million doses early on in our pandemic. And just before the government wanted to distribute it, a new variant in South Africa emerged, the beta variant. And there was evidence that showed that AstraZeneca wasn't very effective in preventing beta um, infections. And at that stage, um, we didn't have all the knowledge that we have now that vaccines are better with preventing severe disease than preventing infections. And the government then decided not to use these vaccines. And there's been huge disagreements about whether that was a good decision or not. And then we had a small group of anti-vaxxers, very vocal, but also people advocating for ivermectin and chloroquine and, and um, similar situations than in other countries. But here is how the politics informed how political leaders essentially responded to pandemics. So um, because Tauben Beke um, came, became president so shortly after democracy and there were still such strong views and feelings about the Western world, it meant that when we reported as the media on it, you were often perceived as either you for democracy, in other words, you support Mbeki, or you against democracy, in other words, you don't support what he says. And when that translated to HIV, which of course is based on science, that wasn't always how editors of media saw that. I'm just going to go to a next slide to, to where, where that is all documented. So what happened was that initially, health reporters um, reported on HIV in my country, but gradually because of this political situation, we had newspaper editors taking in on stances for or against HIV as the cause of AIDS, political reporters as well, and often going against health reporters who would have a science-based background um, on the basis that you shouldn't not show solidarity with a president who really was part of a team who fought very hard for freedom in the country. Where in the case of COVID, um, all reporters became health reporters overnight, but there wasn't a choosing side situation. There wasn't you for the government or against the government because they essentially, um, everyone agreed on the course of COVID. Um, in the case of AIDS reporting, um, there was a lot of reporting done by political reporters and often confusing views. So you would have a health reporter at a publication reporting on the science of HIV, and then you would have a newspaper editor allowing a columnist who completely um, disregards the science of HIV and have it both in one publication. And there would also be instances where a health reporter would just simply not be allowed to report their views because of the political um, views of uh, editor and not be able to report certain aspects of the science of HIV. I myself was working at our public broadcaster at the time, and um, the broadcaster is very strongly state controlled. So um, I wasn't the most popular person at the broadcaster because I supported the science of HIV. And there was one specific instance where I had the head of news walking into, I was a television reporter, um, walking into the studio, grabbing a tape out of my hand and said this won't go on air because it criticized the president. So it was a complex situation. Um, the government often viewed journalists who did support the science of HIV as the enemy. And as a result, information was, was not very accessible. So simple information like how many people have HIV or what do the latest antenatal results say about HIV infections in the country. It was held very um, close to the heart in the government and it was hard to get hold of those in that information. And there was a as a result of that, there was a lot of he says, she says type of reporting because what you had was you would have the health minister saying something ridiculous like ARVs are poisonous or you should rather eat garlic 
to um, improve your immune system. And then you would have activists or scientists coming out with a press release issuing and explaining why was the health minister wrong. So the reports would center a lot around almost comics sometimes. You know, the health minister said this, but it's wrong. This is what the correct thing is. And as a result, because we didn't have ARVs because of this type of these views, we reported far more about access to treatment than on the actual treatment or how it worked. So the science of treatment wasn't so widely reported on in the media. Get COVID, come in COVID, um, the reporting was very much centered around science of, of behind um, COVID and also policy reporting and whether you know the correct policies were implemented or not. And the government also, um, it, at least initially, viewed the media as a partner as opposed to an enemy and had things like weekly Friday morning briefings to inform the media on what are the latest um, developments. There was a dashboard that everyone in the country could access with the number of vaccinations done, um, the, the latest infections, what age groups they fall in. And there were often national addresses by the health department that they would use scientists if there's anxiety in the country, explaining and breaking it down with quite good, um, really good effects and, and bringing down anxiety. That does not mean they were consistent in it. They weren't consistent. It would happen and then it would disappear for a while again. And at the height of COVID, we had our health minister fired because he was involved in a corruption scandal where a communication part um, company got a lot of money to do COVID um, communications, huge amount of money, and um, the money wasn't spent well. And he was in, it was close associates of them who got the money. So the misinformation that resulted as a, uh, as a result um, and, and that emerged in these two pandemics were a bit different. So in the first place with HIV, the misinformation was mostly spread by political leaders because the head of the country, um, you know, was the main person initiating it, where during COVID, political leaders who attempted to spread misinformation, there were some, but they were stopped pretty quickly. It, it was frowned upon and it was not encouraged. But during HIV, the, the speed at what the information um, spread at was not as fast as COVID because we mainly in South Africa during that time only had print publications. That was basically newspapers that weren't online. And the broadcasts in which, you know, which reported on that couldn't be recirculated because there was no YouTube. Our, our, our broadcasters didn't use YouTube at that stage. And there was also no social media. So it meant the information had to spread word by, word by you know, people telling each other about it or buying newspapers. And um, although the, the, the information was strongly supported by many people in government and politically driven, it couldn't always spread at the same speed as COVID. During COVID, we had Twitter, there was WhatsApp groups, which are very widely used in South Africa. Broadcasters would do interviews that they have on live and then put it on YouTube afterwards that can be reviewed. And um, they were, of course, it was very, very easy to um, get scientists or whoever who, um, on, on the TV that who you want, because you could just do Zoom. You didn't have to get them to the studio. So it was it was a quicker process. And in South Africa, I don't think the like in many countries, the misinformation wasn't always malicious. It was often rather a lack of understanding of science of journalists because they didn't have a science background or of regulatory approval processes or simply the politics of science. And when it comes to the politics of science, here's one example of politics that did emerge during COVID. So three months into our pandemic, there was huge pandemonium in the ministerial advisory committee because scientists were really competing for attention, whose um, voices would be heard most. Um, not everyone agreed in the, on the emerging science and how it should be used. Things like lockdowns, there was a lot of disagreement around that. And there was also unhappiness about the way in which the committee was managed. So 
those sort of politics did emerge and, and was a feature throughout the pandemic, but it was different with H compared to HIV in the sense that it didn't deny science. Maybe there were different interpretations of emerging science, but it, it didn't deny the cause of, of the, the, the pandemic in the first place. So at Becca we tried to address this misinformation in various ways. So the first thing we did was we did research. Um, that picture about vaccine misinformation was an op-ed that we worked on with our activists in the country to look at what are the best ways to address misinformation. And what the research consistently say is there's not much um, purpose or sense in taking on anti-vaxxers or people who spread misinformation directly, it's better to try and address their audience. So in this case, it would be vaccine hesitant people. So as a result of that, we did more explanatory journalism and we expanded the mediums that we use to um, tell stories. We generally, we have a niche audience of decision makers. So we try and address scientists, academics, activists, policy makers, politicians. But during COVID, that audience expanded and we had a responsibility to also help ordinary people, more grassroots people, understand and, um, a science and break it down. And in order to do that, we needed different mediums. We couldn't just take print stories that refer to peer-reviewed studies. So we produced a lot more one minute, 30 second videos to, that we distributed on social media to access that audience. And we would sometimes do things like if there was a scientist explaining um, something during a large press conference in a good way on television, we would record it and we would take short clips with tweets that we just distribute on social media that would break things down. In addition to that, we looked at um, um, doing using forms of reporting on social media in a um, on the same medium that we would have misinformation being spread so what we did is we did a lot of twitter threads which scientists did as well and which would if something gets announced and we see there's going to be anxiety for instance if people want to know how many vaccines have we got in the country left you know before the next batch arrives because we had a, a, a consistent shortage of vaccines we would get the information from government and do a twitter thread it would be a lot quicker to do that than to do a story and then put it out there and those sort of threads would get retweeted a thousand thousand five hundred times and then be quoted by other publications, their stories would essentially be based on it. The other thing is that we did is we did, we formed partnerships with broadcasters. So we did a lot of interviews about stories and about basic science of COVID to try and break things down. We were three reporters during COVID. It was myself and two reporters. And just during 2021, we did more than 400 interviews on radio and television stations, which is quite a few. And we also started to produce a jointly television program and one of the um, stations in the country. Examples of stories that we did was we tried to use analogies. So um, the left hand side um, story that says making the perfect burger was a story. It was actually a longer story about um, Sputnik V vaccine um, of Russia trying to explain why the science isn't that sound. So in order to do this, we needed to explain peer review processes, we needed to explain regulatory processes, and we used a hamburger as an analogy to explain how each of those things fit into making the perfect hamburger. So we would, for instance, say, you know, the the bun represent the public safety and their trust in medicines, and the lettuce would help the burger keep its structural integrity, and that would focus on regulators and explain and break down the process that regulators follow when they approve um, a vaccine. Sputnik was rejected by our medicines regulator in South Africa, and we would then um, continue to fit in peer-reviewed processes and how that worked and why is it sometimes flawed and why would data of some vaccines get published when it's not, you know, entirely um, rigorous and what are those gaps. 
Um, and then once we've done a story like that, that is a four part story, which is mainly aimed at decision makers, we would break that down into a one minute 30 video, maybe four videos of those different aspects and much easier language and much more absorbable so that people who are not interested in, in stories in, in, that goes into that much depth um, could get the information from a much easier version. The right hand side is an example of a video. Again, we did a print story and then we repurposed it for a video. Looking at the forms of ivermectin going around in South Africa was mainly animal ivermectin. That, that was what was accessible in South Africa. And then rather than doing a story that directly attacks people and say, don't use ivermectin, to rather um, come in it from a different side and look at why is it harmful to take animal medicine and then use ivermectin as an example so that it's not as confrontational and people are at least prepared to to to, to open the story or to to play the video and in that way since we felt that we, we reached more people. Something that we started during COVID was a resources section on our um, website. And those were um, stories that were not traditional stories. They didn't have a proper beginning, middle and end and, and um, in, in a way that a general print story would have. They sometimes consisted of bullet points. For instance, if uh, um, the government would issue new lockdown regulations and it would be issued in, form, in the form of a gazetted regulation with very difficult language in it, we would take that thing and just have bullet points and translate it into language that people can understand. And those were some of our best read stories, ironically, um, during COVID, not the ones that we spent hours and hours on. And we would also have stories where we would have video clips in it. So an example would be um, why would you want your child to get vaccinated as opposed, you know, because they don't, because um, severe disease is not, not such, such a big issue among younger people. We would then have a very um, credible expert and scientists became quite famous in South Africa during COVID. So people would like seeing a certain scientist in that story. And we would have links with just the video clips of the person explaining um, why, why should they vaccinate their um children. And then we also had trainings for non-health journalists. So we partnered with epidemiologists um, and had one course on that broke epidemiology down and another that broke vaccines down. The first course was about six weeks, twice a week for an hour in the evenings. And we targeted African journalists who weren't health journalists because they had to start reporting on COVID overnight without having been exposed to any of the science, we hosted the course and the epidemiologists would speak. We also had webinars um, and didn't just look at new information, but also addressing the issues that journalists faced psychologically, because many of them were attacked by anti-vaxxers, also that very long work hours that often resulted in, in unintended misinformation in reporting. So um, on the left-hand side, we had a webinar that um, allowed journalists to speak out about how they mentally felt. And we would then write stories about that. That is a write-up of that webinar with video clips for people who didn't want to watch the entire webinar. And we partnered with organizations like Cochrane to, to equip journalists to look at how do you find a study, journalists who've never had to find a study on, on, on the web, for instance, and what are good ways of, um, of doing that and how do you look at a study, whether it's credible or not. Lastly, we um, published our own op-eds, also those of opinion makers, but we were aware of the fact that misinformation didn't just happen in our country, but elsewhere. And one of the examples of that was the Omicron travel bans for Africa, which was not based on science, those decisions, and more on prejudice. So we published a science-based op-ed on that, and this op-ed got used by the World Health Organization at the Accelerator meeting to quote why um, travel bans should be stopped. And we used Canada as an example in this um, of it. And um, the Canadian High Commission in South Africa then contacted us, did us and informed us that they used the op it in a meeting with the Canadian government to explain why the travel ban should be dropped.
Lastly, we had webinars with new COVID data. So on one of our webinars um, that we made the information accessible to journalists as well, we released the world's first data on the impact of HIV and TB and how ill someone gets with COVID. Um, and, and also their likelihood of getting infected. And then this webinar was quoted quite widely, but it was something that journalists could go back to if they were confused because we would make it available for free on, on, on our website. We were attacked by anti-vaxxers quite severely, and South Africa is a pretty violent country, so the kind of threats that you get are often of a violent nature, and um, rape threats, um, I had to endure personally pretty often. Um, um, insults is one thing, but it's another thing if, if people threaten you with gender-based violence. And um, we faced a lot of funding criticism because our main donor is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And we faced a lot of criticism that we support vaccines because our donor supports vaccines. A way of responding to that was not to respond directly. We got a consultant who helped us to draw up uh, a Q&A or frequently asked questions about how we make editorial decisions, how we safeguard ourselves from donors interfering with our editorial content. And we placed that on our website and then tweeted it pretty widely. In addition to that, we got help from the International Women's Media Foundation on how to secure ourselves online. My Twitter account got hacked. And after that, I um, you know, got help from them and also our staff members to um, get better equipped on how to protect ourselves. My last slide is the lessons um, we learned during COVID at Bikisisa. I think the most important lesson we learned was that accurate information really isn't useful if people don't understand it. And in order to prepare for future epidemics, the best skill you can develop among journalists is to break down science and policies into something that people can understand. That's harder to do than to understand science. You can go to a scientist, they can break it down, and that scientist will understand it also very well, but not necessarily be able to convey it in a way that people understand. And that we felt was um, that what we we spent the most time on and that what's the most useful um, of, of, I think, of our reporting was the fact that we tried to spend time on making it easy to understand. Secondly, we had to be very strategic in what we decided to cover. We didn't cover news. We do analytical reporting. And if we tried to cover everything, we would have ended up covering nothing. So it's important um, to make quite thoughtful decisions on what you decide to cover. Partnerships really carried us through the epidemic. Um, we um, had broadcast partnerships, but more importantly, we had a very strong partnership with a data journalism organization. So where we had access to information at the health department, because we have a history of working with them that a data journalism organization couldn't access, we didn't have the same skills as the data journalism organization to turn that into information into a, a, a visually appealing graphic, for instance. So we partnered with the organization and did consistent projects with them here in South Africa that helped us very much. We also repurposed stories. As I mentioned, we did more videos. And not just did that make information more accessible, but it bought us time to do more in-depth print stories. If we didn't have those videos, we would have put out too few stories. But those videos helped us to, that was something that we could produce relatively quickly and then give us more time for the other stories. Consistency is the key to trust. If you consistently report accurately and consistently report in a responsible way, in other words, not try to be sensational, it in the end translates to preferential access to information. So in our case, that meant that we could WhatsApp the head of the health department and say, what's the latest vaccination figures or um, a kind of information that wasn't available online. So we had a dashboard that would, the government would make daily vaccination figures available, but what it didn't make available was how many vaccines are left. 
Um, and it was often the health department was a bit scared that it would be used out of context. So it, it didn't make it available publicly. But we could WhatsApp and immediately, if people get anxious, ask for that information and then do a quick threat. And that has helped us up until today with, with getting access to information, those relationships that were formed. The other thing that we learned was that you cannot live today and think as a journalist, your only job is to put out a print story there. If you do not adjust to the new forms of reporting, which is from YouTube to TikTok to Twitter threads, you will simply not get your message out in the um, most effective way possible. And we learned during COVID that some stories don't even need to be on your website. They can go onto social media channels and they may even travel further than on your website. So you need to adjust to those formats. The uh, last two things is that branding is a thing during pandemics. And that was something that, that counted in our favor. It was a fantastic time to learn how to brand our organization because COVID was so in the field of our reporting. And the last thing was gear up for attacks. If people start taking note of your stories, you're going to get attacked. It, it's always going to happen and better to be prepared for it than not to be prepared. Thanks, Julia. Mia, thank you so much for such an excellent presentation. So incredibly informative and fascinating to hear about um, the contrast between HIV and COVID. Um, I think if we bring together um, your presentation and Tom's, the message is clear. Health is hugely political. The political context of outbreaks matter. We can only hope to be, um, um, I guess, as lucky as South Africa that you had a more rational um, science-minded leader um, when the pandemic happened um, compared, sorry, when the COVID pandemic happened compared to, to HIV. Um, so, so I guess that's um, a wish for the next one, right? Um, and then the interesting part, I think, from both of your presentations is this um, political context shaped not only the scientific debate, but it also trickles into media coverage and um, both studying um, in Tom's case and reporting on um, pandemics in Mia's case um, in such an environment is very difficult and, and personally challenging and um, requiring this need to adapt. So Tom turning to specialty journals and, and finding different places to um, place the studies and Mia um, turning to all these new channels of media and trying to address um, audiences in new ways. So really, really fascinating um, presentations. And I just wanna remind the audience, you can post Q and A's. Um, if you click on this Q and A button at the bottom of the screen next to raise <clears> hand. Um, so you can post your questions and we'll, we'll try to get to, to all of them. Um, Mia, I was curious if you had any way to measure the impact of the misinformation combating you were doing. Do you have a sense of like, um, where you were maybe particularly successful or campaigns that went really well versus those that didn't? So um, because we don't have funded, we need to track impact. We need to tell our donors what, what we do with their money. Um, so we, 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 we track where stories, you know, where they end up, what people say about them. And one of the ways in which we track that is to look at, for instance, on Twitter, who retweets them and with what kind of comment um, to know if we have an impact, say, among policymakers, we would want to track whether policymakers actually retweet our stories. And um, that certainly happened. Our Twitter following um, tripled during COVID, so um, which... Uh, to us, it's an indication that people wanted the information that we put out there. Another indication would be our newsletter subscribers, which also tripled. Um, and in a newsletter, you can see who opened the newsletter and who clicked through on stuff. And um, that happened far more regularly than prior to the pandemic. In addition to that, um, we got consistent, consistent emails more than ever from the public to our general email address um, asking us questions that they should really be asking the, the health department. And those would be questions based on misinformation. For instance, you know, um, would this uh, vaccine um, kill my child or give my child heart information or how often? And um, if I had to look at how regularly we got, got those, um, I would say we got about 
10 emails like that every week for a small organization that uh, not every week wow. every day that's quite a few few emails so i do think um, that that people found it useful yeah can you say what type i'm just curious if there was a type of um yeah coverage that led to like a real, real the most like upticks in subscribers for example um so, sorry i couldn't hear that julia Oh, I was curious if there was a type of coverage that, that kind of led to the greatest uptick in subscribers or, for example, was it debunkings or, um, yeah, it's, uh, what, what, ki what kinds of, what type of coverage um, went particularly viral and attracted lots of subscribers? Well, um, maybe was it the timeliness of um, when you were extremely timely in addressing, um, addressing misinformation or um, political coverage or I don't know was there some way to characterize where where you really saw that impact so um there were different types of things at different times periods during the pandemic that would result in that at the beginning of the pandemic information like what do lockdown regulations mean for your life and how should you follow it because people really were just confused about what to do during some stage when masks became a thing um information videos that would break down what a mask can do can't do what are the different types of masks that it um that that you could have access to re really um resulted in a lot of responses and then vaccines when vaccines emerged when we explained um you know what is a common side effect what does that scientifically mean or what does a rare side effect mean and um if we would have a video that say only focuses on one vaccine on pfizer or on j and j that we have here that breaks down how um often you could expect a side effect that really appealed to people remember in my country vaccines were viewed against um, the background of we didn't have vaccines for a long time. Mm. So people were extremely anxious to get vaccines. Everyone's, you know, wanted them when they arrived. And then about, say, three, four weeks after they had arrived, people became aware of side effects, you know, with research that were done in Western countries and became scared of them again. So a reporting that addressed um the side effects during that time um, resulted in a, an, you know, in newsletter um, subscribers increasing, in Twitter followers increasing. Where during the time that we didn't have vaccines, updates on when will we get them, um, or how, you know, have we signed contracts with um, pharmaceutical companies? That type of information was more useful during that time. Interesting. So it was kind of hitting your audience with um, with content on the questions that they had in the moment that they had them on the channels that they were that they um, yeah that they were using. Um, Tom, it seems like um, one of the big messages from your talk was this need for humility in general, but especially when it comes to respiratory viruses. And I was curious if you could rewind um, to the outset of the pandemic. What would you have liked? to see in terms of this discussion about um, mode of transmission. So as you noted, it tended to be extremely binary. The virus is airborne or it isn't. Um, there was a real lack of nuance. What, what, you know, just thinking ahead to the next pandemic, what, what, what suggestions do you have for um, media and politicians who might be um, trying to communicate um, uncertainties and what we know about um, transmission of a novel pathogen? Um, I, I'm not sure that I would rush ahead to the next pandemic because this one is not finished yet. Um, that's up to Dr. Tedros to, to, to tell us whether this is over or not. And as far as I know, it's still on. Um, so it's not tomorrow, it's today. Um, and it's this, I think that the, the, the basic problem is this vision of science, which is certainty. Mm. Um, and the people cannot cope with uncertainty. Um, so if there's anybody listening, thinking about going into quantum physics, uh, I would recommend that they don't go if they can't cope with uncertainty. Um, um, science is not about certainty. So that if we knew why we were on this planet, if we knew what the meaning of life was, if we knew how the planet had been created, what God looks like and so on, we wouldn't need any science. We'd have all the answers, but we don't have all the answers. 
So we need to just be very, very humble and uh, we need to understand what the limits of our knowledge are. And we need to, um, I think, lower the temperature of um, the, uh, I wouldn't call it debate because there hasn't been a debate. Uh, there's just a split between official science and all the rest. Um, there's pigeonholing um, and there's uh, continues to be attacks. Uh, we're, so we're entering, yeah, sorry. sorry. I was just going to say we're entering, I think, an even arguably even more difficult climate than um, the outset of this pandemic with um, rising inflation, um, more right wing governments being coming into power in many countries, um, yeah, joblessness, um, climate climate um, change, like the, there's so many pressures um, that, yeah, I'd like to think that the, the heat will come down, but I think it's going up. Um, um, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't, I, I'm not a political commentator. I don't know anything about politics and I do not understand economics, or at least I don't understand some of the things that have been done uh, recently. But uh, I would sort of recommend a lowering, general lowering of the temperature, um, because there are some pretty uh, disturbed people around. And uh, um, this exasperation, this um, you've seen, um, I'm showing you the flip flop, you know, one side definitely is not able to don't say things like that about respiratory right. viruses, please, yeah. because you run the risk of. Uh, falling uh, on the other side it's it's all this extremism and these factions um i it's fueled by by the by by social media fueled by mainstream media but mainly social media i would uh, think and of which yes, mainstream media is a part sorry of which it mainstream media is a part uh, social media well, people, uh, yeah I think that there's going to be new ways of expressing uh, ourselves. We've found a, a way to express ourselves in, in a civilized manner, I hope, uh, on platforms like Substack, and yeah. where there is little or nowhere. There, I'm not aware of any censorship, but there have been there's been episodes of censorship in journals, in uh, very prestigious uh, scientific organizations. Um, and some of the examples that I, I, I know of are absolutely appalling. Um, and it, 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 people are even registered uh, um, websites, domain names, under the names of other researchers to stop them from opening their own websites and to insult them and attack them on a website that bears their name. This kind of thing is... <laughs> Horrendous. Uh, it's just horrendous. Um, but it's happening now. We, 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 not we for the next a, pandemic. Yeah, no, good point taken. We only have a couple more minutes and we have three questions. I think um, Tom addressed one just in the Q&A, but I was curious if you could speak to it because it kind of gets at this issue of um, the yes, scientific is, process and uncertainty. Is, so yeah, someone... Of, sorry, this is one of the problems, that, one of the many problems. That's a sloppy use of language sloppy use of terms. So uh, systematic review uh, and meta-analysis are, are sometimes used as synonymous. They're not. They're two different things. A systematic review always should precede a meta-analysis. But a meta-analysis, which is a, it, it's the quantitative aggregation of data, um, usually homogeneous data, but not from the same study uh, design, but not, not necessarily so sometimes, uh, the meta-analysis cannot exist without a systematic review, but a systematic review can exist without a meta-analysis. Uh, systematic review is literally exactly that, gathering whatever is available according to a protocol. And depending on what you find, you may do a meta-analysis, uh, which is a, a pooling and an analysis of data. Okay, just for those who weren't following the Q&A, the question was the difference, what's the difference between systematic reviews and meta-analysis? Um, thank you, Tom. Um, a question for Mia, how can we educate people on the true nature of diseases 
and recommended medical practices such as vaccines without the influence of governments and politicians? I think it's very difficult to do that because if I can use HIV as an example, it's entirely possible to get all the information that you need to report on, on the disease or on medical practices without the government. But it doesn't help to get that information, report on it, and then the president um, refutes it the next day or confuses people. So I think that's why it's important that me, we as the media hold the government accountable to put the right information out there, but also to provide the things, for instance, vaccines in this case, so if it's COVID or treatment ARVs in the case of HIV, to provide evidence-based treatment that, that, that people need. So I think um, we need to get the government on board. I think it doesn't help to report accurately in an environment where what you say is, is, is just disregarded or, some, or, or president says it's wrong the next day. We really need to try as the media to hold the government accountable to get the right information out there. And in right. HIV in South Africa, that ultimately happened along with activists. You know, we did put enough pressure on them. What I think is so interesting about your talk, this contrast with um, the HIV context um, that you have that you had with Mim Becky and and um, thinking yeah about the U.S. context with the pandemic breaking out under Trump, there was definitely this similar parallel of a very much like activist grassroots scientist um, pushback and lots of accountability journalism. So that came out me. I think you missed this, but I had a little intro with um, a review that was done of um, reporting um, in in the journal Nature. Um, in the first phase of the pandemic, and they talk about how um, the U.S. was one of the places that had um, lots of accountability journalism, and it seems like under Ramaphosa, you really had this um, more explanatory journalism than accountability, um, so you kind of saw shifts, so so it's just that, that, that maybe is one, I don't know, I don't want to say an upside, but you, um, yeah, this, this need for accountability journalism becomes more urgent um, in political contexts like the one you had during um, HIV or what we saw in the US during Trump. Um, so yeah, that's a, kind of an interesting um, bit of context. So there's one last question in the last two minutes, maybe I'll give it to Tom. Um, do you think establishing a communicable diseases clinic in hospitals is a good step to improving the quality and understanding of I guess, health reporting. Hmm. Um, um, sorry, establishing a, a clinical... Uh, a communicable diseases clinic in hospitals is a good step to improving the quality and the understanding of reporting. We could maybe broaden it out um, just to the yeah. question of how do we improve the quality of health reporting. I, th I think, you know, you've got a new tool, a relatively new tool, um, say, let's just take PCR because P polymerase chain, chain reaction has been the basis of all the, um, especially the early stuff. Um, you have to understand, um, like all tests, like uh, say a sphygma manometer, how do I use a sphygma manometer? Um, well, the, there are some rules and the, for, the, for the maintenance of sphygma manometer, but also for the use of sphygma manometer, there's some parameters. And the way that you, you, you calculate so somebody's hypertensive or not, and you do it in certain ways. Um, if a clinic like the one that's been suggested would help uh, people understand um, what, the, uh, what the strengths and limits of uh, something like PCR is, I would welcome that. But I would make another point, and it's the fact that there is it, it is a multidisciplinary effort. It's not just a physician on his own or her own anymore. I work with molecular biologists as well as statistician epidemiologists, and you have to an infectious disease specialist. You have to do a it has to be a multi uh, a, a, a multidisciplinary effort because. What we have now is very powerful, but incredibly complicated. And um, if, if you can understand the basics, I don't claim to be an expert, um, but you have to understand the basics. If a clinic in hospital is useful, well, that's great. 
But remember that respiratory viruses are primarily a primary care problem. You, the hospital sees a, a section of these, uh, usually people who are un very unwell with them, and which unfortunately is common. Well, thank you so much. It sounds like, um, yeah, sorry. Um, Dr. Allen, sorry, had a comment that a communicable disease clinic is useful if they know how to find the real evidence. That's a good point. Um, so I think we have to wrap it up. But thank you so, so much, Tom and uh, Mia, for such fantastic presentations. Thank you to the audience for great questions and um, wish you all the best in this pandemic and the next one. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.